All right, looks like they're about to close the door and we're about to begin. So I wanted to say a, a quick welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Stephen Cockrell, the CEO of The 74, which is a nonprofit news site covering education in America. I'm thrilled today to have uh, Brooke Stafford Brizard and Broar Saxberg with me from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the transition from research into practice when it comes to uh, education uh, in America. I uh, wanted to give both of you an opportunity uh, to introduce uh, yourselves and your work. I know that they're uh, both really impactful as well as very complimentary. Uh, and after you have an opportunity to do that, then we'll dig in. Sounds great. Thank right. you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Brooke Stafford Brizard. I lead our whole child development work at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, I began my career as a middle school teacher, uh, and then I did uh, my graduate work in human development, where I learned essentially everything I wish I had known as a teacher, um, and have, have spent my career focused on um, broadening the definition of success in our schools and our classrooms and grounding that in the science of, of human development. Um, and the work that, that we focus on at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, is represented in this, this framework that you see here, um, which is how we define whole child. Um, and this is grounded in six key developmental domains that uh, are informed by multiple fields of science, um, from educational psychology, cognitive neuroscience, social psychology, um, and this is our holistic picture of, of the child, the adolescent, and frankly, the adult, um, as we think about how we support educators. Um, and so you see um, academic development is here. We don't define whole child as everything but academic development. Um, we also name social emotional development, um, really critical skills like uh, emotional awareness. I'm looking at Mark Brackett, our expert here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but also resilience and curiosity. We name uh, cognitive development because uh, often in, in frameworks that look at uh, SEL or, or academic, we drop really key skills like visual processing and executive function. Um, we also focus on identity development in our work. Um, and this is where we're really learning um, from key fields of science like social psychology around every individual's unique sense of purpose their personal identity, their cultural identity, their collective identity, um, and really ensuring that um, we don't reinforce um, an imposition of purpose or identity on students, but that we really understand how to support them in developing those. Um, and then we name physical and mental health in this framework, because you cannot tease those apart in the child, um, so we don't when we think about whole child. Um, and so we'll talk today about how we draw from multiple fields of research um, to, to inform our work in this space. And I'm Bora Saxberg. I look after learning sciences at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, I started life as a researcher. Uh, I used to do research on human and machine vision at MIT. And then uh, through a series of changes, shifted from being a research guy to being somebody who tries to apply research at scale. So uh, I helped start a, an online education company. Uh, before coming to CZI, I was the chief learning officer of a, a large education company called Kaplan, and uh, so helped many different units there think through for their own students and teachers how to apply the science of learning uh, to their circumstances. Um, and there's a lot that we have about how learning works that can be directly tied into the actual work that teachers do and can also help blow up some of the myths that people have about learning and about their capacity to become good at things that we really need to get out into the world. And we'll be talking about that. Absolutely. And you both actually hinted at this, and we're going to dig into it a little bit now, about some of the lessons that can be learned from research. Uh, and I would love to hear from the two of you. Uh, what's the one or two uh, kind of top line lessons that you uh, have seen implemented within the field uh, that have been learned from uh, either human development and learning science? Well, I, we could pick a couple of things. There's actually quite a few things. The, the first thing is um, the science of learning reinforces some terrific practices that the best teachers have always done. Um, things like looking very closely at the motivation of a student while also doing the teaching. And, you know, people are pretty good at that if they pay attention to that. And you can tell if little Brewer in his math lesson today is just a lump. He's not paying attention the way he usually does. You don't need to give him a separate standalone 
motivation test. It's like he's got his head on his side of his elbow and he's just, you know, sighing there. So you ask questions about that, right? Well, the science of learning and development, as Brooke began to talk about, really strongly reinforces this idea. You got to put the whole picture together because parts that are not academic will absolutely block the academic work from being possible. Um, and vice versa even, that things that are uh, holdups on the academic side can lead to identity difficulties that will actually block you. The other thing that the science of learning and development I think does that's really important is that it helps remove some mythologies about what to think about learning. So one of the classic ones that's still around so much is this notion of learning styles the notion that we can categorize minds as either visual minds or uh, you know kinesthetic minds or auditory minds and you know it's so attractive to think that we could make that distinction and then make all the instruction line up with that but every time people have done evidence gathering on this and every 10 or 15 years people actually try to do some careful work they have not found a way to bucket brains in ways that are actually useful for instruction. But it's still so popular. So the science of learning development very clearly shows there are other ways to make instruction match the circumstances of learners. That just happens to be one that doesn't work. I would add, you know, we, we continue to learn from multiple fields of science about the importance of context. And that allows us to kind of move from this being seen through an individualistic lens. We, we never develop uh, isolated from context. So um, we continue to learn about the critical importance of relationships mm -hmm. and how re relationships drive learning. Um, in addition to the physical and emotional environment around students and how critical that is um, to not just uh, you know, unlock motivation, but um, you know, set up processes for, for learning. Absolutely. Um, and you both actually mentioned the word identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm curious, especially in this moment in time right now, when people are discussing culturally relevant uh, mm -hmm. curriculum um, and uh, taking a look at um, how we can make learning really relevant to the individual uh, student, no matter the context, I'd love to hear more about what learning science and human development actually uh, brings to bear on that particular uh, piece of the conversation yeah. that we're having nationally. And, and that's a space, and I've alluded to it, where we're trying to expand what we mean by the research practice partnership. Mm -hmm. And so there are incredible researchers and partners in the field who haven't necessarily been brought into um, K-12 practice. Yeah. And so um, we, we are working with and partnering with some incredible researchers who are helping us understand um, the, how dynamic identity development is. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at not just you know, personal identity, but cultural identity and collective identity, how important it is to, to feel part of a community. Um, in addition to, to civic identity, how important it is to understand what you owe back to a community. Um, and so these are the spaces where um, we're really learning how that connects to um, how you structure a school environment and again, um, d something you don't impose on a child or a student, um, but help them understand um, what, what's meaningful to them and mm -hmm. how they can bring that to, to yeah. their, their work in the classroom. Absolutely, so for, that, for me that begs the question, uh, where are you seeing people that are on the cutting edge of this research? And you know, if there are people that are actually implementing it well, what are the examples of that? Well, uh, in terms of uh, identity and thinking about uh, who you are, your sense of purpose, where you're going, um, one example of a, a set of resources and practices that's been pretty good comes from High Resolves. Mm -hmm. They originated in Australia as an organization um, looking at uh, uh, crafting students into global citizens through a series of programs in the schools uh, uh, across Australia. They've now uh, managed to work with 150,000 students across Australia, have now come into the US and begun doing work in New Orleans, the Bay Area, in Canada, and are beginning to expand. And what's interesting about them is they clearly show this combination of both kind of the, the cognition side of learning science, but also then some careful thinking about a sense of purpose and the actual skills that are needed to be a global citizen and to have an identity that ties into your community and feeling a sense of agency within your community. And what's interesting about this is, um, and uh, you know, often people think that issues of identity or social and emotional learning are different than uh, issues of uh, cognition or academics. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
all of it needs practice and feedback to become good, to become you know, fluent, to become natural. And we often forget that about many of these other areas. So High Resolves has very much absorbed lessons from the learning sciences and so has structured their experiences in ways that first gain interest from a class by having an interesting peak experience for the whole class at once and then having activities that the teachers and their classes can do together within the classes that use the same frameworks and reinforce those spaced out over time, again, spaced repetition, and then finally have outlines of how to engage with the community on projects that make use of the same frameworks that the students have been practicing in their classrooms. And again, that's based around the research that says you need to end up practicing in contexts that are as close to the real world as possible in order to keep triggering those frameworks for the rest of their lives. So it's a great example, I think, of folks who are mixing together learning sciences, but also these ideas of uh, identity and purpose that are so valuable. Absolutely. Yeah, so <clears throat> in a previous life, I did a bunch of work uh, with educational organizations that were attempting to change practice, which is a lot of what we're going to be discussing today, all the way down to how do you get a teacher to change their practice when they're delivering content uh, to a student, and all the way up to uh, how do you get uh, senior leaders at uh, the largest school districts yeah. in the U.S. to change uh, the structures and systems that are in place to actually facilitate that sort of uh, teaching and learning. Uh, if you could identify one or two gaps within translating the lessons that we know are effective, uh, the things that we've researched and know are really critical to human development, to student learning. Uh, what are the one or two gaps that exist within like our current education structure in those places where we could really move the needle? Uh, well, I would, I would recognize um, this is not just a gap, but a, mm -hmm. a contradiction of what we understand of mm -hmm. child and adolescent development in terms of how many of our discipline systems are structured. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we know that uh, what a child and adolescent, even though it can be very frustrating, um, needs when they're escalated is connection and support. Um, and a lot of our practices still tend to isolate the student, um, immediately provide consequences that don't help them to understand how they can build um, a skill for regulating and de-escalating. Um, and uh, we, don't, we don't prepare teachers with the, uh, the brain science and, and the science behind this to help them understand, again, what's happening to the brain and, and how they can support that, that student. Um, so that's a gap that I think we can address and it's, it's one that we've heard um, so significantly from, from the field. Absolutely. And I would add to that, um, that's an illustration of a, of a real kind of institutional problem mm -hmm. that education seems to have, which is this translation gap. Mm -hmm. And you know, many other fields actually successfully, not perfectly, but still successfully move from the research environment into practice. Mm -hmm. So you know, medicine does that. Another example is uh, when you look at chemistry and chemical engineering, for example, you know, if you're building a new pharmaceutical factory, the last people you want designing it are chemists because they don't understand health issues, they don't understand economics, they don't want to figure out what is the metal needed to hold 5,000 gallons of reactant. They have no interest in that. And so, you, you know, you need someone who loves that kind of work and to Brooke's point, is multidisciplinary, is actually drawing from multiple sciences at once to solve a practical problem. And that's why chemical engineering as a discipline, in a sense, exists. And it is a thing that people get trained on. They are trained on modern chemistry, and it gets updated as chemistry changes. But the real work is that application work. And we don't have that running right now within the education space. Uh, an equivalent of kind of a learning engineering analog, if you will. Mm -hmm. So you, there, you would have no way of really knowing this, but my sister's a chemical engineer, and this oh. is, <laughs> I mean, that was almost triggering for me. Like, that took me back to, to, to far too many kitchen table conversations with her about how critical her role in the world is. I agree with her. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, well, she now agrees. Now it's on record. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, now it's on record. Now I'm going to have to hear about it again the next time I see her. <laughs> but that actually brings me, you know, to this question, right? We're talking about translating research into practice, and you've just identified, you know, uh, one of the 
structures or uh, roles that other industries have put into place to actually do that effectively. What do you think that would look like within the education space? Are there people that are doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there are people who are doing it. We mm -hmm. just haven't kind of formalized like what this yeah, is, and there's certainly no structures to actually train and build a stronger pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we we've spent the last year learning deeply about a number of schools that are integrating whole child practice, and so there's a, a school in Atlanta called the Atlanta Speech School, um, and they have a specific role there um, that is is focused on pulling from basic research. So a researcher, Pat Cool, at the University of Washington has done phenomenal research in language development. But that's in basic research. It's, it's laboratory research. Um, and so there's a specific role at this school where this individual and her team are drawing from that basic research and working um, to translate it into practice and what it actually looks like when you prepare teachers around it and build structures to apply it. Um, but that is, that's the frontier. We do not have enough of those roles. And we certainly don't have them in all schools and certainly not in all systems. But um, the, the breakthroughs that, that that school has had accessing research that, that they wouldn't have otherwise are profound. And we are trying to help think through what can be done to you know, bring more of these ideas into practical use for the ecosystem. So for example, we've invested in something called NeuroTeach Global, which is uh, a, uh, it's actually a learning science grounded professional development approach to helping teachers apply learning science in their classrooms. So it, it's a little meta in that it's learning science used to design a program to help teachers apply learning science. And it sounds very complicated, but it's actually very straightforward. It's basically at the beginning levels, it's simply iPhone uh, based uh, or smartphone based scenarios of uh, situations in classrooms that are t that whose solutions are tied to principles of learning science. So that teachers are learning the learning science by investigating a classroom problem that could easily happen to them or may have happened to them already and then see how that works. And then again, another principle, another principle. And the idea is these are you know, two to seven minute segments so they fit into the day and lives of incredibly busy professionals and they build up over time, ultimately at the highest levels, you use that same smartphone to actually do videos of attempting to run that practice in your own class, can submit those and get feedback on that from the community of learners who are kind of in your cohort. So it's, it, it's one of the ways to try to get this kind of information into the hands and hearts of people who want it and need it. Another example of this is work we're doing with a group called Deans for Impact. They are uh, looking to find some uh, volunteer schools of education who are interested in redesigning their first year programs, uh, their early programs for teachers, to make them more grounded in learning science so that teachers really wind up with a practical toolkit of learning science principles of the multidimensional kind we're talking about and have practice and feedback on using those principles in their practice. Um, and it's another issue which is we got to make sure that we give teachers enough practice and feedback. They have minds too. Those minds learn the same way their kids' minds learn, which means we have to pay attention to motivation as well as to enough practice and feedback to build the fluencies using these new techniques that they need. So you've both just mentioned, you know, one or two potential new programs or technologies, a new staffing role uh, that could live uh, at a school or at a network and I'm channeling my friends who work within schools and networks of schools and they're freaking out right now. How are they you know, going to accomplish this? Is it going to cost them additional funds? Are they going to need to repurpose things uh, within their current system? How do you, the, the pieces that you all have called out sound phenomenal. How does that translate into uh, a world of limited resources? Well. We avoid terms like intervention and wraparound Indeed. support on cool. our team. Mm -hmm. right? So this idea that you would take this existing paradigm that was established before all these sciences of human development and learning that we're talking about, and then find interventions and supports that you would kind of tack on to the outside of it. Um, our work is about design, and it's about integrated design. And so, and that is not a, a one three-year effort that we're just going to you know magically you know shift the the entire system but what we look at is 
from the from the beginning of the design phase mm -hmm. instead of like what what can we add on to this person's day what can we we tack on um, and think about integration <clears throat> excuse me um, as the key mm -hmm. and so um, there are limited resources but <clears throat> excuse me go water break. <laughs> water break we'll take a water break we'll come back <laughs> Curiously, there's research that shows being hydrated helps problem solving around <laughs> 20 to 30 percent. No, I'm not kidding. Actually, I'm not kidding. That's actually that, that's real. So you know, this is, this is we, we are now you know getting ready to handle the toughest questions here. So Re research um, to practice. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what, I mean, another example of, of where we are helping to try to do this in very practical terms is our very close working relationship with, uh, with Summit, the Summit Learning Program. So there are hundreds of schools of all different kinds, public and charter and urban and rural, and all different kinds across the US. Uh, 50, 60,000 students, I think. It's a very large network. And they are trying, uh, and have been for years, working off of a different learning model that involves uh, uh, project-based learning uh, together with uh, individualized approaches to building their own skills and relationship building between the students and the, the teachers together, right? So this is the kind of environment that can be augmented and helped by bringing to bear more and more of what we really know about the value of relationships and the, the value of these different approaches uh, to learning and how they help each other and also when they're gonna contradict each other and therefore you gotta kinda back off and work on one piece rather than another piece. So that partnership allows us to end up being very grounded in real world practice so that as we begin to try to uh, uh, work with others and get ideas on into the ecosystem we'll have a partnership there that allows us to really test and see in many different circumstances what do you have to do to make this stuff work um, I mean context is really key in all this mm -hmm. Brooke you actually just mentioned a design process uh, to implement these things, that it's not just a, an add-on program or uh, adding one position uh, to a staff, that you actually have to take an organization through a design process to actually, in a lot of ways, reconfigure uh, how they function. And you know, I've been a believer for a long time that success is a function of realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. So can you talk uh, to us about uh, how long those processes can take uh, to really do it and to do it with fidelity and some of the barriers that you've seen folks run into. Sure. Um, well, and you know, we, we continue to learn from partners who've been mm -hmm. at this for decades. I mean, this is not an invented wheel. Yep. Um, and so <clears throat> those who we um, have, have best understood kind of um, where there are barriers and mm -hmm. accelerants to this mm -hmm. um, did start at the design phase, but it's you know, this is decades of work. Um, <clears throat> and some of the things that we've learned is um, are um, how critical adult capacity is. Um, but two things. One is the knowledge base that we need to develop in adults. We do not prepare teachers through the lens of human development. And so a lot of these, um, these schools that we're learning from um, have had to address that as they, they bring teachers into their communities. <clears throat> but we've also learned how critical supporting the whole teacher is. So um, you, you don't support self-regulation if you're not regulating yourself. Mm -hmm. And we also know that there's a difference between this type of self-regulation, you know, um, and kind of focusing on all of these things here and being a teacher in a classroom of, I had 35 kids in one of my sixth grade classrooms. Like mm -hmm. That's educator self-regulation and that's, they need support too. Um, so we've really learned a lot about what we can um, focus on in terms of adult capacity in the, both of those spaces. Um, measurement is also an incredible challenge in, in our schools um, around these constructs. And so how we actually build um, practical, reliable, useful tools that can be used in a formative fashion to understand how we support students and adults um, is something that we continue to hear even from schools who've been at this for decades. Mm -hmm. And how long of a process is it to actually build those sorts of reliable measures and and what do they look like too is the other is the other question I have well this is part of the reason that there aren't such good measures mm -hmm. especially for non-academic side mm -hmm. because it takes a pretty big lift to do the right work yeah. and so the right work involves first making sure you've defined a thing that can be measured. They, the, the, the psychometricians call it like construct validity. Do you actually have your hands on something real 
that, that you can measure. And that takes some effort to do. And then, you know, what are the pieces of evidence that you're going to pull on, whether it's observation pieces or whether it's specific tasks or analyzing other data. Um, and then you have to validate that those pieces of evidence, that they really are measuring the construct by comparing those measures to other measures. And yeah, if that sounds tedious, it's really hard work and it takes a while, but it is the way you end up with uh, tools at the end that folks can rely on and especially compare, right? Because part of what happens with measuring well is then different schools, different researchers can begin to compare their results. And in a context like mine, if you are using similar measures for identity development, let's say, mm -hmm. I will then be able to say, hey, this is working for you. I agree with these measures. Our contexts are similar, so really valuable to do. But it can take you know, four or five years sometimes to, to build new measures. Um, and uh, another piece of this that's really important uh, that, that relates to what Brooke was talking about, about the development process, we're trying to get uh, communities in much earlier into development processes than they historically have been. So sometimes the, the, the research to practice work looks like researchers have an idea of what will help mm -hmm. classrooms. They get developers to build them. They dump them into classrooms. They collect data. Maybe they publish a paper. Our job here is done. Well, wait. I mean, look at where the users were. They were almost at the end. And if you want to do really good design, you've got to pull them up to the front. Even in healthcare these days, um, uh, there are uh, many research groups are now pulling patients into the very front of the research process, even in some cases making patients into principal investigators, PIs, to make absolutely sure that what's being developed actually fits the real world context for those, uh, for those patients. Same thing I think we need to do more of in, in the work of developing new ways to help students in complex circumstances with development. We've got to bring the communities all the way in at the front and not assume they're going to be the same. Yeah. And so, you know, that last line of, uh, of conversation that you just went on raised something else for me. Uh, a lot of the conversations that I have with, uh, with leaders across <coughs> America over the course of the last 10 years uh, I've really found that the folks that are doing a lot of the cutting edge work are leading with an equity lens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's their North Star. And if the, the approaches or the reforms that people are discussing don't account for that or benefit that, then they won't even entertain uh, the concept. And so I wonder, is this actually a mechanism to get us to a place where we have a more equitable uh, education system where we have a more equitable experience for all students across America. Um, are there uh, proof points uh, mm -hmm. around that? Um, what would you say to those folks who have that sort of question about this? Absolutely. I mean, our, our vision on the education initiative is to equip all students with the knowledge, skills, mm -hmm. habits, and agency to thrive. So if you're talking about all students, mm -hmm. um, then equity has to be woven into every single thread of what you do. Mm -hmm. um, you might have heard our, our founder and CEO speak yesterday, right. Priscilla Chan, about taking luck out of the equation. Um, mm -hmm. Well, there is systemic inequity um, in all parts of our system mm -hmm. that um, drive the, the luck factor for a lot of students. Um, so we have to be fully aware of that. Th that said, I would say, first and foremost, we we approach equity through an asset-based lens. And so it's not everything that's wrong with these communities, everything that's done, that's done to these communities, but how are we leveraging the strengths and assets of students in their backgrounds, in their cultures, in their communities, and ensuring that they are at the table to name not just kind of the supports that are needed, but the outcomes that are critical. Um, and so it's woven into to all of the, the different components of our work, from the basic research and ensuring that we move from um, basic research that's done with 
you know, homogeneous populations mm -hmm. um, and not representative of, of our students right. in the field, um, all the way through to um, how we are actually partnering and ensuring that um, our communities and our mm -hmm. teachers are at the table from the front end. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing, so I kind of want to underline this point as well, um, because you've both now mentioned being community forward with this work, making sure that um, the people that are going to be most impacted by these efforts are incorporated into the process all along the way and at the very beginning as well, which is you know a core tenet of any sort of uh, proper design process mm -hmm. anyway. Um, are, who's doing that well right now? Because I've been involved in some design processes that have attempted to do this, and I've seen some folks do it really well, and I've seen some folks do it really, really poorly. Uh, and I've found that if you can point folks to examples or uh, a stepped out process for doing it well, then it helps implement with fidelity. So I'd love to hear examples, uh, even if you've just got one, of folks that are really doing that part of the work well. Well, I, I might point to uh, a set of resources that, uh, that we support that are actually trying to help lots of folks do this well. Mm. It's a group called Transcend. Mm. And they, uh, they have uh, frameworks and practices to help uh, innovators who want to create new school models or modify an existing school model mm -hmm. at a district, say. And a lot of what they make sure uh, those teams do and think about is work very closely with their communities. So uh, we really like to support them in part because they are bringing in the sciences of learning and development. Mm -hmm. They are trying to uh, take the frameworks and research and turn them into very practical descriptions of ideas that then folks who are working with communities to create new educational environments can put to work. <coughs> and, and one of the things that I, I, maybe it's implicit in what we've been saying here is these same principles mm -hmm can end up being used to make learning environments that look very different one from another. Mm -hmm. And so these don't constrain tightly what the school or learning environment looks like. You know, when do students and teachers say hello? What is the relationship between the student and the teacher during math versus history? No, no, none of that is specified here. That allows you to then use a design mm -hmm. process with your users um, uh, and some good frameworks and experience some others doing it to build much better solutions that are fitted to that community. Mm -hmm. So Transcend, I think, is an interesting example of resources to try to help many folks do this well. I, I would also quickly point Please. to a, a partner, um, Citizens of the World Charter Schools. Indeed. Um, and um, we, we don't need to get into the details of their model, which, mm -hmm. which we were learning a, a lot from, mm -hmm. but they will spend years mm -hmm. in a community mm -hmm before they actually move That's forward with the charter yeah. authorization. So it's really working arm in arm mm -hmm. with community members to determine what this should look like, mm -hmm. where it should be, mm -hmm. um, and then building um, connection across different communities mm -hmm. um, where they're, they're housed to, to actually build a, a stronger collective community. Absolutely. Okay, at this point, I'm going to hit the pause button. Um, a lot of you might not have been in the room when we had a, a little bit of a, a back and forth around sandwiches, which is incredibly <laughs> random. It's just the mic uh, check. <laughs> but we had a, uh, a lovely audience member who helped us answer a couple of trivia questions around where the term sandwich originated and how that related to the sandwich islands. But because she was so, uh, you know, she was so giving with the answers on that front, we allowed uh, her to ask the first question from the audience. So if you would be so kind. So in listening to you talk, I Mike? heard this um, presentation has been super interesting with your wheel. Yeah. I've been reflecting a lot about the comparator of medical research. Or Excuse technology. me, could you use the microphone? Because that way it'll go out to everybody. Yeah. Yes. You can just grab it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. Thank yeah, you. my voice is gone after three days of nonstop. <laughs> uh, three days of what? Yeah, researching. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about your comments about medical research and um, chemical engineering. My background is a recovering biology teacher, but I've spent a lot of time on the tech side of the house. And so I, I have also spent a lot of time with folks who are developing technologies around medical research or financial services or oil and gas, et cetera, and then thinking about the role of scale uh, and scalability. And really, um, you know, I don't think it's practical to think you're going to have a 
dedicated head of who mines for fundamental research in every school. I just don't think there, there's a practical funding model for that. So can you speak to the role of, I mean, the reason that, that pharma has moved so far towards that personalization and scale of things like cancer is because of the investments of the Broad Research and, and in fact, the Gates Foundation. And they've really leveraged the technology for that scale. And I think in K-12 education, it's still locked up in disparate SaaS systems and solutions. So can you speak to anything that CZI might be doing specifically around thinking about how to take data and use it to inform and scale this sort of translation from research to practice? Mm -hmm. Shall I start? There's, sure. there's several things that we're, uh, that is a, such a good observation. It is one of the problems. So there are a number of things that uh, can help and that we're trying to you know, help accelerate. One is just simply describing context in, uh, in a common language. Um, you know, if you, if you look at medicine, early wins came because you could completely ignore context. If you had trench foot in World War I and you got a sulfa drug, you lived. If you had trench foot and did not get a sulfa drug, you died. So, you know, it got pretty clear that this chemistry thing, sulfa drugs came from the dye, chemical dye industry, was a good thing. Your mom's education level, uh, your personal identity, none of that had anything to do with its impact. You know, trench foot, sulfa live, trench foot, no sulfa die. Well, more recently, people have discovered in medicine too that many things are way more complicated than that. That when you look at the big randomized control trials and you know, it still seems to work better, but it's a movement of a bell curve. When you break open the bell curve, you discover some folks didn't move. A few folks, even in successful trials, unfortunately went the wrong way. And so now they've begun thinking, oh, we gotta pay attention to subgroups, to the context of the, 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 the patients. Well, learning has actually always been such a context-relevant discipline. And if you think about it, if all of us define those contexts differently, then we can't share our results. So one of the things we're doing is working with a, a research group on, on a project called Impact Genome to try to look at research papers and begin to code them against a common taxonomy of where was this research conducted? what kinds of schools, what kinds of teachers, uh, all of those context information, so that if, you have, if you're in a certain kind of school and you're looking for help on math for my kind of school, that then the database you search can become more context relevant. You may not find a school that's exactly like yours, but you can find schools that are closer to being like yours. Instead of now, when you look up math research studies in middle school, You'll find 20,000 research studies, but you have no idea whether they are relevant to my students and my teachers. So I think that's one of the pieces that we're trying to do. And to push that taxonomy mm -hmm. beyond math mm -hmm. reading to, to pulling from the clinical research and understanding how, how important it is to understand mm -hmm. how we support the mental health of students in schools. Mm -hmm. um, so the taxonomy, we want to become something that's more representative of this. Mm -hmm. um, even though we won't expect every school to have a functioning health clinic, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's really about how we understand the 24-hour cycle of the child and how we can support needs, but making sure that our taxonomy expands beyond the traditional academic definitions. We, you, you may want to talk a little more about the, the frameworks and working with multiple frameworks and sort of pulling them together a little bit. I you know, think everyone that... will fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. Thank you for your kindness. You're welcome. You. <laughs> um, and so our agreement was actually that you got to ask one and to gift one. So who are you gifting your next question to? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. go. Microphone? Oh. Sure. Uh, Do you plant him? No, 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 no. <laughs> so, so we, uh, look, this, this is a framework. We have, I think, actually over 130 whole child SEL frameworks in the field, right? Um, and so the, um, we, we have investments to ensure that we can support um, the, you know, the leaders in this work to align to the latest science and then align and, and build more coherence across each other so we stop confusing the heck out of practitioners. Um, and so um, 
in addition to that, you know, there's, there's the piece of actually putting the work in a framework. This is very high level, right? So are, so are many of the frameworks out there. So how do we support practitioners um, to find the right tools and supports to actually take the framework and put it into action and take ownership over it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Stephanie Jones at Harvard wrote a nice piece about this, the, the, the difficulty that practitioners have right now because mm -hmm. of the chaos of terms. So if I want to you know, provide some training on, uh, I don't know, uh, communications skills of students, well, different people are defining that different ways. Mm -hmm. And so as I look for research and then look for tools and then try to find a way to measure it, I run a serious risk of having a, an incoherent set of things that are all called uh, communications or even worse, SEL, right? An SEL program. And, and the result is it doesn't appear to work. But what may be wrong is that none of the pieces were actually going after the same constructs. And so this work really is important to kind of cross connect these and then find tools to help practitioners be able to, to find the things that are matched up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sure. So my understanding was that all of you are here today not just to hear directly from us, but you have some questions as well. So don't be bashful about those questions. There's a microphone here. Feel free to uh, hop up and to ask. While we've got uh, these two, let's, uh, let's leverage their, uh, their learnings. Great, thank you. I really appreciate this really invigorating conversation. Uh, picking up on a couple of the pieces you are just discussing about the way to assess and the way to measure, um, particularly outcomes. Um, and so I guess what I think a bit about is the old question of if students sort of do and learn all of the things that teachers or an educational institution ask them to do, then what have they learned and what are they able to do? Um, and so when I look at this framework and I think about, okay, so what kind of adults would this produce? Like, does this produce the adults, the leaders that we need to go work on the problems of tomorrow? Um, like, those are outcomes. And so we're in this current educational context, we use these proxy measures of like 10th grade math and English scores to try to anticipate where they will be. With the, and, and I'm thinking about the, the talk on the Harvard Longitudinal Study of saying, okay, 75 years later, the relationships that you have are vitally important to your ability to thrive. So with, with the resources that you have at CZI, are you engaged in those kinds of longitudinal studies? And, and what are you able to learn about those longitudinal effects that then we can sort of back map to say, all right, well, what are the things we should be looking at in schools? Because some of the conventional metrics don't seem to be picking that up. So, you know, three years into our existence, we do have you know, multi-year investments and, you know, like, like Gore mentioned, um, to, to develop these, you know, valid, reliable tools takes time. Um, and so we have begun that process. But in terms of um, that broader definition of success and back to, like, really being clear about how we define things, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So um, beginning these efforts to, to partner with key researchers in the, in the field to understand what a multi-dimensional definition of su success looks like when we name financial stability, health, purpose and fulfillment, participation in democracy. Um, how can we understand how that's represented as an index um, across Americans in our society um, and um, ensure that as we engage in longitudinal efforts, it's not just you know, Harvard graduates from 1935, which is not exactly the most diverse population. <laughs> okay, hi, thank you so much. My name is Joni, I'm from Washington, D.C. So I, I, have, I do have a question for CGI as well. So um, policy nationwide, we know public schools serve the most population across the nation, no doubt. And also um, as a public sector, we worked very hard on improving access to Mental Health um, Service Act. And because of the funding by the go federal government, now public school is able to hire an extra counselor for mental health. So I'm wondering, what is CGI, CGI, uh, CZI trying to do to also um, collaborate at a more broader policy umbrella? to support as a social impact because I know we start, you know, personal funding, but how do we make the research and practice into the next level of policy? How do you plan to influence that? Thank you. So, um, thank you for that question. We are, we are tracking an enormous um, momentum behind um, policies focused on mental health at the state and federal level. Um, and as we've learned from partners, um, 
in the field over the last few years, we understand better how we can um, connect to, to those policy discussions. And so um, we have partners who have, um, you know, Valor Collegiate in Nashville. Those, that's a school founded by twin brothers. Um, one who has a traditional background as a school principal, but the other who has a background as a therapist and a social worker. And understanding how that school has been designed through that lens and understanding how um, Darren, who has the therapy background, um, has, has implemented that with rigor, helps us to better understand what that can, you know, the policy implications for that. In addition to, uh, you know, Roses and Concrete is another partner that we have, which is, it's a school in Oakland. Um, and uh, we are supporting work there that's focused on um, how um, they are building a tra trauma-informed environment with a clinical partner in the city that's focused not just on how the environment is established to support the students, but how are we taking care of the teachers as well, who um, there's intergenerational trauma in that community, there's secondary trauma as the teachers are supporting traumatized students, so that's including one-on-one -on -one counseling, which is not scalable, but we're learning a lot about how we can um, better support it, and again, the policy implications there. Mm -hmm. So those initial small partnerships and deep learning with, with schools um, will help us better understand um, how to bring that into the policy arena. One other example of that is work we're doing with Jack Shonkoff at Harvard, um, who was one of the early researchers to recognize and even name the, the, the problem of toxic stress. Um, the research showing that if you are under continuous stress levels, especially as a kid, the cortisol in your bloodstream actually blocks the chemistry of learning gets in the way of those chemical reactions from happening. And so it's, it's not a matter of will or character or whatever. It is literally the chemistry stops the learning from happening. So one of the things that Jack has now been doing is working with communities and pediatricians in those communities as well as the schools to begin to try to you know, draw a, a circle around those folks so that pediatricians are actually able to be involved in looking at the development of learning by looking at issues like uh, stress and cortisol levels. Um, and so that again creates a, a combination between a healthcare professional, the schools, and the families and the communities as well. And so that, that to us is a, just a really interesting way forward mm -hmm. because of how essential pediatricians really are in the lives of families. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hi, my name is uh, Anshul Arora. Um, I wanted to ask on a kind of broader level of abstraction. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, to give you some context, I'm working with some philanthropists based in Asia, and they're trying to think about where can they channel their resources for maximum impact. And one of the areas they're looking at is the science of learning applied to a very different set of contexts. So in starting your work, I imagine you probably thought about where do we want to um, direct our efforts in this very broad field. Is it about where there are knowledge gaps? Is it about translating that research? Is it about tools and practice? Who else is doing what? Where can we play? So there's almost like a, a step back in thinking about where do you channel your efforts and your resources. My question is, is there, um, is there resources out there that actually show the state of the industry as, what, as, you, as so that to inform other groups and philanthropists who are thinking about what to do? And a second question on resources is just simply, like the Deans of Impact report, are there other resources that you suggest for practitioners to cut through all of this noise to say, like Jack, Jack Shonkoff's Center on the Developing Child for Early Ed, are there other centers or resources for us to kind of cut through the noise? Mm -hmm. that, that's a large question, potentially. <laughs> uh, I'm glad we have a couple of minutes to answer it. <laughs> um, so so uh, I, I think, I know, um, I think it's Omidyar who did a network analysis of, I think, the U.S. industry of education to try to help them do some problem solving about where they wanted to invest. I don't think they've turned that into something that's outward facing, but they have done some heavy lifting on that front. Um, in terms of resources for helping practitioners, there's actually quite a range of syntheses out there that are, you know, ranging from uh, relatively easy uh, pieces to work through, like um, uh, Daniel Willingham's Why Don't Students Like School, which is a very nice synthesis of a lot of learning science for teachers, to things like uh, e-learning and the science of instruction um, by uh, Ruth uh, Clark and Richard Mayer. Um, and that's a, that's a great handbook for design. It says e-learning, 
but it's really about full-on design. So there's a range of resources there. Um, there's an article that uh, Richard Clark and I did on uh, motivation that actually has a uh, Harvard Business Review version that tries to synthesize a lot of research about uh, motivation issues that may be helpful. There's a wide range of resources that are there. The challenge is when you ask where are the gaps, it's not so much the knowledge part, it is the translation part. It is uh, giving people experiences and training to take any of those resources and put them to work in their context. That, that's a gap and that's a piece that we're thinking hard about as well. I'm going to ask our producers if we've got time for one more question. Uh, since I'm going to pretend like they gave me the Hassan and said yes. So <laughs> if you if, synthesize it, make it brief, and then we'll see if uh, we can get an answer. Hi, I'm Dale Johnson. I work at Arizona State University. Can you get closer yeah, to the mic? Yeah, Sorry, to the mic, mic up? There yeah, we go. that's good. Hi, Dale Johnson, Arizona State University. I'm fascinated by the discussion of design and design thinking in this conversation. And I wonder if you've convened a conversation on structural impediments to change. The, the most pressing, I think, is age-based cohorting, mm -hmm. which is central to everything we do. Can we blow up the system and redesign it from first principles, or is that too much? Mm -hmm. I don't think we can blow up the system, um, but what we can do is, is be bold enough to say that like, we don't have to accept this paradigm. I mean, I think if we, if we continue to accept K-12 as it was designed over a century ago, we will get nowhere. So if we work together to better um, understand that we can, act, we can have breakthroughs and it's going to take time, but we just don't accept that this is a paradigm that we have to work within. And I think the key is we have to chart a course to a goal. And sometimes when you're sailing, you have to tack, right? You may not be able to get right to that goal that is a much better learning environment, but the winds may push you in a direction, but you're making progress. And so part of that is what is the progress we can make while making those down payments towards a much better solution that may be decades away, but we've got to figure out how to make that progress now. Well, this morning, uh, we've heard just uh, a snippet of the fantastic work that Brooke and Brewer are doing, as well as uh, CZI writ large. Uh, but thank you all for sharing. Can we give them a hand? Uh